So welcome to the lecture about Roman architecture. When we talked about um, Greek art, we talked about sculpture um, and some of their architecture as well. But honestly, uh, Roman architecture is more, um, had more of an effect on what we're gonna see later in this class, uh, both in form and technologically. Uh, and part of that has to do with the history of the Roman Empire that we talked about before, expanding way beyond um, its original borders. Uh, so having an effect in that way. Um, and then we'll also talk about painting. And I didn't talk about Greek painting. Uh, and part of the reason why is it doesn't really exist so much. Um, and what few paintings that we have that are most likely influenced by Greek styles of painting are Roman. Uh, so when we talk about Roman painting, painting in the next lecture, that will enable us to um, kind of bring in Greek painting as well. And as far as sculpture, there are some differences in um, the subjects of Roman sculpture, but the styles are too similar to make it worth going over Roman sculpture separately. Uh, so we'll talk about architecture. I don't know if any of you have ever been here before, uh, but this is the Colosseum, the ruins of the Colosseum in Rome. So some of the basics, uh, Roman architectural elements. Uh, the first one is the arch. Um, and the arch is very useful. We kind of saw like an early version of the arch when we were looking at the Great Pyramid in Giza, the Cuckoo's Pyramid specifically. Um, and what's useful for the arch is strong and self-sustaining. Uh, so much stronger than the post and lintel type of construction that we've seen in most of the architecture we've looked at. Uh, so how do you make a, an arch? Um, it's kind of shown here. Uh, and I'm gonna get you a link uh, to a video um, a little bit later on when we talk about Gothic art that will show this um, in three dimensions and you'll be able to see how it's done. Uh, so the first thing is they have a form and this will be used over and over again in the building uh, called a centering. And you would build up the bricks from the bottom. And then when you get to the middle, you put in what's called the keystone. And once that is put in, uh, it's like a lock and you can take out the centering and it will stand on its own. It will be um, very strong. So when you take an arch and extend it, it's called a barrel vault. So that's pictured right here. Uh, and it's supported by heavy walls. So basically when you make an arch, the force goes down into um, the posts here. Um, and it's spread out a lot more than regular post and mental construction, which is why it's used. Uh, but when you do this with a barrel vault, that means you have to have thicken walls here. We'll see some later solutions when we look at Islamic art uh, and Gothic art that are a little bit more um, interesting. So this arch form was known by the Egyptians at least going back to 2700 BCE, so even before the pyramids, and the Greeks in the 5th century BCE, but they didn't use a monumental arch, so they had them as kind of like um, scientific experiments more or less. And the Romans perfected the use of the arch uh, along with their use of materials. So the groin vault is when you take two barrel vaults and they meet in the middle. Uh, and this allows you to have a pretty expansive space uh, without having walls that are as thick as they would be if you're using post and lintels. So the easy way to tell if there's a groin vault, if you're standing on the ground, you look upwards and you see an X on the sky, then you know you have a groin vault. So um, the material that the Romans used, uh, that they're most famous for, uh, they didn't develop it, it existed before, but again, they used it, um, kind of perfected it, was concrete. And concrete is a very simple uh, type of material, but depending on how you balance the materials uh, that go into it, uh, makes a big difference. Uh, so concrete is mortar, in other words, something sticky, gravel, and everybody's got that, uh, and rubble. Um, and then you need water on top of that. 
So these are the types of things that you can find anywhere throughout the empire. Uh, so as a result, uh, it was very useful when you wanted to build, when the empire wanted to build the same sorts of structures throughout the empire. So it's strong, it's lighter and cheaper than solid stone. Uh, you can build it anywhere. And then they would take local materials uh, to pretty it up and make a facade on the outside. So it would be covered with marble, brick or stone, whatever was available close by. So another thing that's a very interesting about this concrete is that um, they built everything with it. And one of the things they built were aqueducts, uh, which is a water transport system. Uh, and they built it with arches in the Roman style. Uh, you can look up Roman aqueducts. And these, these structures are 2,000 years old, and many of them are still being used. So you might think to something like 75, Interstate 75, that's being worked on right now and has concrete you're thinking, wow, that country can't even last a few years. Um, and there's reasons for that, um, which are kind of complicated. But um, I'll give a link to this in the description for the video, The Riddle of Ancient Roman Concrete, where these material scientists try to figure out why um, the concrete has lasted so long. So to get into the structures, this is a sanctuary of Fortuna. Uh, Primigiana, Genia, uh, and Palestrina. That's in the late second section, century BC. So what we're talking about is um, during the Roman Republic, uh, but during a brief period when the Roman Republic was uh, taken over by an autocrat. So Roman builders characteristically speak to us through their massive size and bold conception. When you look at this picture, everything that is below this line um, is the ancient structure, and then the things that are above uh, are more modern structures, but they try to kind of copy what the ancient structure looked like. So it's dedicated to the Fortuna or fate cult. Uh, Fortuna spoke through an oracle. Now, this is a tradition that the Greeks had as well. Uh, so the building on top is more modern. Uh, the first level colonnade terrace is ancient. Uh, so I'll give you uh, a reconstruction and give you an idea of what's going on. So kind of like what we had seen um, previously, uh, it was molded to the site. So this is a reconstruction of what it looked like originally. Uh, the first set terrace uh, had the semicircular recesses. Uh, and you can see how the arch forms continue over and over again. Uh, so these work in, the, in that they allow entrances, the arch is strong, and you put lots of stuff on top of it. It also kind of brings things down to earth. Otherwise you would have this big um, kind of a boring uh, facade by making all these tiny arches and these repetitive elements kind of brings it down, down to the human scale. Uh, so the second scale, the second terrace has barrel vaults uh, and we're going to see this sort of structure again. So have we seen something like this before? You can pause it and try to guess. Okay, so it started again and you can look at the funerary temple of Queen Hatshepsut. Uh, so same sort of thing with multi-terraces, repetitive elements uh, that are down the human scale, uh, and then also molded to the site, which is fairly important. Uh, so this uh, structure was made when Rome was briefly royal rather than a public uh, temporary dictator, Sulla, who ruled from 82 to 79 BC. So another thing you can maybe apply to uh, modern cultures um, a, a lot of governments will start out as republics and end up as dictatorships. This is the Colosseum in Rome, and we're fully in the imperial period. Uh, and you can see how we have some of the same elements that we were talking about before, lots of repetitive arches. Uh, otherwise, this would look like a big cylinder and kind of boring. Uh, so more details that kind of allow um, this structure to be interesting visually, and it's not ne necessary for the structure of it, are we have engaged columns. Uh, so we'd seen these in ancient Egypt. Engaged columns don't actually do anything, uh, but they provide some visual interest, uh, and they also kind of connect things vertically, uh, and then kind of allow your eyes to move horizontally. Uh, you can see how <laughs> they use many different types of engaged columns. Uh, we have the Doric and the Ionic, and then what's called the Corinthian, uh, which is kind of the fanciest, but usually for more lightweight type building. Uh, right here, we have cartouches. 
So kind of like modern stadiums, uh, you see they usually have some kind of corporate sponsor and then, um, you know, if it's baseball or something, you can look into the outfield and you can see all of the various advertisers. That's the same thing with this. Um, wealthy families in Rome, they raised the money uh, for the Colosseum. Uh, and when they did, they were able to get some of their family crests on there. Also have barrel vaults that go into the inside uh, and allows people to look to the outside. That's a repetition and balance. Uh, Jansen says it is through them that this enormous facade is related to the human scale. So uh, exactly as we had seen in the sanctuary earlier. Um, so if you look upwards, you can guess what kind of vaults these are. We have barrel vaults going this way and a long barrel vault going this way. But when they meet in the middle, it's a groin vault. Um, you can see the X's on the ceiling from that. So the Colosseum is kind of interesting. Um, when you look at ancient Rome, there's definitely a lot of parallels you can see uh, with modern uh, grand empires like um, the UK uh, and certainly modern day United States. Uh, this was built in the middle of the capital city. Uh, it was made to house 50,000 spectators. Um, the tickets um, were available to almost anyone. Uh, so they had like special seats for the most wealthy but in general, uh, everybody could sit together and attend this type of, of events that they would have. In there. Uh, so what we're looking at here is the basement. Uh, and there would normally be a floor if they're having some kind of like um, acrobats or circus show or like animals or even like gladiators. Uh, they would have um, wood over these sections and then cover it with sand on the floor. Well, what has been found out recently uh, is that it was probably used for sea battles, uh, a very complex drainage system that leads into the waterways uh, in Rome was found. So they could have flooded it um, and um, did some of these kind of water battles. So think of like Las Vegas, like the Pirates of the Caribbean, uh, it would be a similar thing to that, except with famous battles. So this is the Pantheon in Rome, and we're getting towards the height of the Roman Empire, the greatest extent, really. Uh, the Pantheon, I'm sorry. And Pantheon uh, just means all gods. So this was dedicated to all the gods, the seven planetary gods. Uh, so if you're thinking of planets in the way that we do in the modern world, uh, it's a little bit different. Uh, so um, the planets would be the sun, the moon, and then the five planets that were known to the ancients. So Mercury, Venus, um, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Uh, so those were known to ancient people, uh, and you know the moon and the sun were both considered a planet as well. So a planet is anything that moves through the sky quickly, so it would move the sun and the moon in that as well. So when you look at this from the outside, it's not the best looking building in this part, uh, but you have to realize that in its modern context, it's seen in a totally different way than it would have been in its ancient context. So you need to, when you make a dome, uh, and that means a big round ceiling, uh, you need to have really heavy walls to be able to support all the force of all this stone that you have above it. So it's kind of a necessity to have it look this way and you don't want to poke too many holes in it. Um, but when it was originally made, it wouldn't have looked this way. You wouldn't have been able to see uh, this kind of like, you know, true barrel from the outside. Uh, what you would be able to see is this facade, uh, which is very similar to the Greek temples that we had looked at before, a uh, big old front porch. So when you look at it today, uh, because it's very ancient uh, and Rome has been pretty much continuously occupied, uh, the street level is much higher. So it's kind of ate up a lot of the stairs and the platform that this was originally on, again, to make it look lighter than it, ha than it, do than it would be if it was sitting on the ground. Uh, so this is what it originally looked like. It would be pretty difficult with the way the street was set up to look at it in this way. Instead, you would approach it here uh, and you would have these nice repetitive elements and then you would go inside. You would never even be able to see uh, the outside structure of the dome. Uh, so this is a cutaway drawing of the inside uh, and you can see um, the coffered ceiling. And the way that the coffered ceiling looks today uh, is different than it would have looked at at the time. Um, everything that you're seeing here, almost everything you're seeing here is original. So it's kind of amazing 
uh, how well it's um, survived. So originally, these coffers would have had would have, would have been gilded uh, with gold. Uh, as a result, the oculus, which is where the light comes in from the top, uh, depending on the time of day, would reflect off this gold plating uh, and create this incredible kind of like shimmering effect uh, to look like the he heavens. So remember, this is the pantheon. Um, they want to look like the planetary gods. So the interior space is similar to something that might not seem uh, very auspicious, uh, and that's Roman baths. Um, but the Roman baths were something that, um, even though, I mean, literally, you go there and you take baths, uh, they worked kind of like a spa, and a lot of elite people would meet there, and there would be a lot of important business done in the baths. So kind of like the way that wealthy people today go golfing or something like that. Um, so the interior has lots of holes poked in it. That way you don't have that effect that you have on the outside of this, this kind of like crude barrel. Uh, instead, um, like everything else we looked at, it's kind of related down the human scale and it seems a lot lighter. Um, so the oculus, uh, which is this hole at the top, is 143 feet from this floor. Uh, and then um, the diameter of the dome is 143 feet. So this like kind of um, simplistic symmetry was something that appeals to the Romans uh, in the way that it appealed to the Greeks as well. Um, so again, these gilded coffers would have given the impression of the dome of heaven. But what's also interesting about it is the way that it was made um, with the oculus at the top uh, in this kind of like round barrel uh, kind of form was the way that um, the Romans had made sundials to keep time. So the sundial you probably think of is this one with a triangle and it casts a shadow on the dial that's on the outside. Uh, the oculus type of sundial is more accurate because you can focus the light into a thinner beam. Uh, so that's what's kind of interesting that it's like one of these, this oculus. So at the equinox, uh, which I just passed recently when I'm recording this, uh, the sun hits the junction between the dome and the wall, throwing sunlight through the north entrance into the courtyard. Uh, so this would have been a fascinating effect. Basically, during it, you would have had the sun streaming in here and streaming in here. Um, and um, well, the sun would have streamed in through the top uh, and then it would have been thrown all the way out to the street. And it would have this cool effect where uh, it's basically connecting the heavens through sunlight to Rome and would point towards the buildings um, that the emperor ruled from. Uh, so it's a way to connect um, the emperor with the gods, uh, kind of similar to what the ancient Egyptians would do. So through the play between sunlight and structure, the architects of the pantheon sought to raise their emperors above the ordinary and to the immortal company of the gods. In these buildings, the barrier between time and eternity is dissolved. Um, one more thing I should mention is, yes, there's a hole here. No, it's not covered with anything. Uh, Rome is uh, generally a pretty dry place, but it does rain and it does snow. So if you want to find something to put your extra credit for, just look up snowing inside of the Parthenon. Because yes, the snow and rain comes in. Uh, but again, taking uh, a hint from the bass, these floors have a very gentle slope on them. So they're highest in the middle, and then they slope down to the edges. And along these edges where you see the columns, uh, there is drainage and that leads away from the building. So this allows the floors uh, to be preserved and to prevent flooding. So yes, the rain soon comes in, but they thought of that. Uh, so the last building we're going to look at is Basilica Nova. Uh, the Basilica building we're going to see again. That's uh, from the Greek Basilius, which means king. Um, so what the ancient Romans would do is when they moved into a new area, they would create a capital city that they would rule from, from scratch. And they would build the same sorts of buildings in each of those capital cities. Uh, and then the people of this area, uh, they would basically replace everything they had done uh, to rule themselves. And it, it was in place in a, a different area. So they had one of these in every town and the people that were conquered could come to this basilica and um, get the business done that they needed from the empire. So uh, they were long haul with law courts um, and you know maybe petitions and such. They were conquered people, but you know conquerors often often weren't 
um, conquered people to feel like they they can actually contribute uh, whether they can or not. But this basilica though is different. It's in Rome, uh, so this is more to show uh, the power of Rome uh, in general instead of like showing the power of the conquered peoples, since you don't really have conquered people in this particular area. So this one, um, because of that, it's not wood, uh, it's concrete and stone and stone facing. Uh, and what we're seeing is a very small part of it that still stands. Uh, so see these arches right here? In this reproduction, we can see them. Um, and then we can see how the structure goes, uh, basically a long rectangle. Uh, so the uh, basic parts of a basilica are going to continue into some of the churches and cathedrals we're going to see a little bit later on. Uh, so one of them is the clear story or clustery, later pronunciation is fine, and those are windows that let light into the building. Now you don't necessarily want to be burning candles all the time, you know, so you start a fire. The long hallway in the middle, we call a nave. Um, the narthex would be the entrance, and then the apse would be at the end, this curved area. Uh, and generally, these apses would have sculptures in them. Uh, so kind of like what we saw with the Pantheon, this design was also based on public baths. And some people felt, according to Jansen, that it lacked dignity at the time. Uh, but again, think about what the baths are and how they are this kind of elite meeting place. It kind of makes sense uh, that the emperor would want to create something, the Constantine would want to create something like this. So the emperor uh, Constantine, uh, just like the other Roman empires, even though we're talking about um, a few hundred years later, uh, wanted to show himself as a godlike figure. Uh, so we don't have the original sculpture, but we do have all of the original sculpture in whole, but we do have pieces of it, uh, just to give you an idea. Uh, this head right here, it's eight feet tall. Uh, you can also look at this Italian person from the 70s, maybe five and a half feet tall, and get an idea on the size of this thing. Uh, and then Constantine's massive bicep. Um, so the way he would have been sitting is unlike the reproduction uh, that I showed you in the previous slide. By uh, sitting on a chair, he has one hand that's pointing upwards, another one that would be kind of pointing downwards. And the idea with that is uh, you point upwards to say, this is where my power comes from, it's divine, and then the other one put downwards and I have power over the earth. Uh, this type of form and pose will be used by Christians later on to express the, the same sort of idea. So he may have once held the Cairo, which we'll talk about later, but those are the first uh, two letters of the word Christ, uh, so Jesus's name, uh, in Greek. Uh, so he may have converted to Christianity, we're not exactly sure about that, but what he did do, and we'll talk about this in, in um, lectures when we talk about early Christianity, is basically legalize Christianity, which some Roman emperors had persecuted before. Uh, and we'll talk about why that is. So Constantine adds the second apse for his cult statue. Um, so yeah, if he converted to Christianity, he wasn't, truly wasn't fully converted to Christianity. Uh, this kind of vaulted design, which is very expensive, it fell out of favor with the early Christian basilicas. Uh, once, once Christianity becomes uh, legal, they used uh, things that were more like what you would see in the Roman cities. Uh, and one thing I forgot to mention about Roman cities is most of the famous cities that you think of in Europe were originally Roman cities. So London, Paris are the greatest examples. Those were founded as capitals to rule over the local people by the Romans. Uh, and then later on became um, large international megalopolises. 